Once again, James White, Daniel Wallace, and Bart Ehrman continue to promote fairy tales of scribes inserting the same interpolation of the account of the adulteress in John's Gospel throughout the majority of independent Greek and Latin apostolic church texts in the Mediterranean world. Why are we allowing such statements to remain unchecked? An assertion such as theirs naturally begs the following questions. Who were the scribes? What were their names and why did such an event ever take place? Do we have dates, times and locations where this supposedly occurred? Was the bishop of that apostolic church unaware of these scribes' actions or did he actually sign off on the process? What were these scribes' marketing strategy to get this passage into the thousands of Latin and Greek New Testament texts in the ancient world? Did they call together an ecumenical council or synod with the independent Greek and Latin bishops to sell them on the idea of including this story in the Gospel texts? The fact of the matter is, White, Wallace and Ehrman cannot answer any of these questions or show historical documentation to support their theory. But these scholars continue to jump up and down to convince us that this really happened. Sounds silly, doesn't it? But if there are still doubters, let's look at their theory in this way. Is it possible for any one text to have succumbed to an interpolation at the hand of a scribe? Sure, that is certainly within the realm of possibility, for we are all well aware of scribal mistakes and variations. But a scribe at Antioch copying the text of John, and a scribe in North Africa copying another copy of the text of John will not make the same error, or come up with the same story of an adulteress to write into the Gospel of John. The testimony of Dr. Scrivener, who worked on the committee of the revised version of 1881, confirms this very point when he states, By the science of textual criticism, it is possible to identify where copyist slips have occurred. This is done by comparing the available documents. The probability of all the scribes spelling the same words incorrectly, omitting the same line, word or verse, is extremely remote. Now, what defies all common sense is that White, Wallace and Ehrman would have us all believe in that this same interpolation in John's Gospel was then written in by a different scribe into another text at another church location probably in some other language, and in most cases, placed in precisely the same position in the text. Furthermore, this process was then replicated in thousands of other churches in both the Latin rest and the Greek East without anyone ever noticing. So when Jerome states, in the Gospel according to John, there is found, in many of the Greek as well as the Latin copies, the story of the adulteress who was accused before the Lord. It comes as no surprise that White, Wallace and Ehrman would ignore his statement, because then they would have to explain how this so-called interpolation of the adulteress was written into the majority of Greek and Latin manuscripts throughout the Mediterranean prior to Jerome's revision in 383 AD. Let's not forget that Jerome studied under the Greek theologian Gregory Nazianzen, one of the three great Cappadocian fathers while he resided in Constantinople. He spent time in Rome with Pope Damascus, worked on his translation while residing at Bethlehem, and grew up in Eastern Europe. Surely Jerome is in a much better position to testify to the authenticity of this passage than White, Wallace and Ehrman. Let's remind White, Wallace and Ehrman that Jerome had included John 7.53 to 8.11 in the Gospel of John in his Vulgate edition. On two occasions, he described how he went about his translation project. In the Preface to the Gospels, addressed to Damascus, Jerome wrote that he had revised the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John by a comparison of the Greek manuscripts. Only early ones have been used. To avoid any great divergences from the Latin which we are accustomed to read, I have used my pen with some restraint, and while I have corrected only such passages as seemed to convey a different meaning, I have allowed the rest to remain as they are. For in his Epistle to Marcella, Jerome states that his objective has been to restore the scriptures to the form of the original Greek. Not only does Jerome document the objective criteria for his revision, but he clearly showed that the Latin readings in his Vulgate had to have Greek support. 
How do these scholars explain that in the 4th century alone, we have Augustine in the North Africa, Ambrose Bishop of Milan, Didiamus the Blind, head of the Catechistal School of Alexandria, Jerome, who studied in Rome and Constantinople, and Passian, a bishop in Spain, all who cite this passage in their New Testament texts. Can we give these scholars a map so they can truly see how absurd their argument sounds? Furthermore, these independent apostolic churches all go back to the apostles. Can White, Wallace and Ehrman document where any of these independent apostolic churches are recorded to have ever changed their texts? Under which bishop did these apostolic churches authorize the insertion of John 7:53 to 8:11 into their texts? We can document almost every period throughout church history. We know of Jerome's and other major translation projects, such as the The Philozenian by Thomas of Harkel, which not only included the account of the adulteress, but used an old Greek manuscript from Alexandria that had the account as well. We know of the major disputes between the churches, and we can trace the bishops that occupied these posts all the way back to the apostles. We have the historical records of their councils and synods. So where is the vast conspiracy theory they speak of in the historical archives? We are starting to question White's, Wallace's and Ehrman's knowledge of church history. Because when these scholars attempt to account for the existence of the Pericope Adulteri as if originated in the Western transmission stream and was then somehow carried over into the texts of the official Greek Orthodox churches, it shows just how little they know of the historical Greek churches. For when did the Greek Orthodox churches ever accept anything from Western Christianity? As early as 120 AD, as recorded by Irenaeus, Polycarp representing the Greek churches of Asia Minor stood in defiance against the Pope of Rome on something as trivial as the calculation for the date of Easter. Do not White, Wallace and Ehrman recall that Rome also tried to force the Greek Orthodox churches to insert the Philoc in its creed to no avail. So let's make sure we understand this correctly. The Greek Orthodox Church has refused to insert one Greek word into its creed, which led to an ongoing division with the West for the last 1,000 years. Yet, White, Wallace and Ehrman would have us believe that the Greek Apostolic Churches had no problem accepting 12 verses of a so-called Western reading in its sacred text and lectionary. What's even more laughable than this Metzger assertion that the account of the adulteress is simply a piece of oral tradition, and many others, such as Daniel Wallace, have similarly depicted it as a sort of textual butterfly. Was this passage of scripture really walking around searching for a home? Let's not kid ourselves. We are well aware of hundreds of oral traditions in the churches, but none of these stories ever ended up in the texts of the New Testament. Take for example the Assumption of Mary, a celebrated tradition within the Greek Orthodox churches and a dogmatic statement of faith in the Church of Rome. If scribes had so much free reign to add to the text of the New Testament as they pleased, why wouldn't a story such as the Assumption of Mary that is revered and celebrated historically in the churches be added into the Gospel text? The Assumption of Mary was so popular that it even ended up in the text of Koran, as noted by Sam Shimon. Yet this acclaimed oral tradition never ended up in the text of the New Testament. Even the oral tradition of the ever-Virgin Mary, a tradition defended by Jerome, had never ended up in his vulgar tradition, or in the text of the Greek Orthodox Church, where it has enjoyed strong support. Now, this debate has never been about variance in the texts, because we are more than willing to have an honest conversation with White, Wallace and Ehrman about variants within the textual traditions of the Greek, Latin and Aramaic apostolic churches. But our biggest complaint against these scholars is their insistence on bringing in apocryphal texts to weigh in on this passage of John 7:53 to 8:11, while also rejecting the texts that have been commonly received in the official apostolic churches. These so-called best and earliest texts, presented by White, Wallace and Ehrman as support against the inclusion of John 7.53 to 8.11, which primarily includes such texts as P66, P75 
Botanicus, Sinaticus, T and W are just fool's gold. Please tell us, James, Daniel and Bart, why you place so much weight on these texts. Is it because the origin and history of these texts are unknown? Or is it because these texts were found neglected and abandoned in the deserts of Egypt? No, it must be the fact that none of these texts can establish a legal chain of custody back to any of the historic apostolic churches. So, does it come as any surprise why we refer to these texts as apocryphal? For what do you call a text whose histories and origins are unknown, that can't trace back to the official churches of the apostles? This was a major point in Bergen and Scrivener's arguments against the texts of Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. For these were not the types of texts received and copied by the official Greek churches of Paul, such as the churches of Corinth, Philassonians, Philippi and Athens, which all still exist today, whose bishops all trace back to the Apostle Paul himself, and whose Greek texts and lectionaries basically support this passage as the original reading in the Gospel of John. Since the legal chain of custody has not been procured for any of their so-called best and earliest texts, they are deemed inadmissible in any normal court of law. Let us explain why ensuring a proper chain of custody is so important. Now there's a reason we don't imprison people accused of crimes based on information disclosed in newspapers and other media. A fair trial means following rules and procedures designed to ensure the reliability of evidence provided to the jury, meaning that the evidence is what it's claimed to be. For White, Wallace and Ehrman would have us believe that these so-called earlier and shorter editions of the biblical texts that are deficient in this passage in John are closer representatives to the original text used by the official apostolic Greek churches. So, please enlighten us how the text of Vaticanus, which was catalogued in 1481 at the Vatican Library, can legally trace back to any of the apostolic Greek Orthodox churches. Are you going to stand up here and honestly tell us that you know a guy who knows another guy who has a sister that dated her friend who had a cousin who secured this text from the official Greek church of Alexandria back in the 4th century and had it delivered to the Vatican prior to 1481? Don't you see how silly your statements sound? The same can be said for the text of Sinaiticus, which was discovered by Tischen Dorf at St. Catherine's Monastery in the 1800s. How does Sinaiticus legally trace back to any apostolic Greek church? This is like calling a witness to the stand to testify the events that occurred on the night of July 5th in Central Park, who can't be shown to have ever been to Central Park. What's even more alarming is that we cannot account for the period of time between these texts were discovered and their so-called 4th century date of origin. Remember, evidence must demonstrate reasonable assurance that it hasn't been tampered with. But you cannot demonstrate this, since you can't document who had access to these texts for 1000 plus years prior to their discovery. In retrospect, we know who Jerome was, who trained him and where he was from. We also know that his revision of the Gospels were based on a comparison of early Greek manuscripts, and he clearly showed that the Latin readings in his Vulgate had to have Greek support. Jerome's Vulgate was publicly read in the churches of North Africa and he personally commented on the passage under discussion, stating that this was found in many Greek and Latin manuscripts. Yet, we cannot ascertain any of this information from your so-called best and earliest texts. Plus, how can you say the texts of Sinaiticus and Vaticanus represent the same text type, when Hoskia showed there are over 3,000 differences in the Gospel alone, and Burgon stated that these texts disagree more than they agree? That's like calling up two witnesses to the stand in support of your case, and they both start contradicting each other's testimony. Witnesses like this would surely line your client in jail. And when you refer to these texts as Alexandrian, you must be joking, because these aren't the type of texts that were copied by the official Greek church of Alexandria that still exists today which not only supports the Periscope Dei Adultery in its text and lectionary, but it also supports other readings, such as the last 12 verses of Mark, that are not in your texts. Now, we want to remind our viewers not to be fooled into believing that White, Wallace and Ehrman 
any real allegiance to these texts, because as we've previously established in earlier videos, they reject these same texts when they go against their individually held convictions. Case in point. When the oldest collection of Paul's writings found in PS 46 includes the letter to the Hebrews, do Bart, James, and Daniel then recognize Paul as the author? Don't bet on it. Or when their so-called best manuscripts, Vaticanus, PS 66, and PS 75, agree with the texts of the Apostolic Churches on the passage of John 7-8, why does Daniel Wallace openly reject his own texts for an alternative reading? These apocryphal texts are all about misdirection. Even though White, Wallace, and Ehrman would never admit to it, their whole focus is to get us off the official texts of the Apostolic Churches, so they can sell us on how the text of the New Testament went through an evolutionary process, where readings such as the Periscope Dei Adultery and the last 12 verses were conflated into the text over time. This is why they have to make up stories about scribes that no one has ever heard of, inserting this same interpolation throughout the Latin West and Greek East without anyone ever noticing. Jerome changed one word in the Book of Jonah, and the churches of North Africa rioted. But are you telling us that a passage was added to the sacred scriptures which speaks about an adulteress, which can be misinterpreted to imply that she was left off the hook for her crime of adultery in areas where women are still stoned for this offense today? This passage was publicly read before the congregations on October 8th in the Greek Orthodox churches, and not one objection was raised challenging this reading as an interpolation? Is it really difficult to understand how in the eastern part of the empire, and some parts of the west, why a passage like this would be difficult to accept, where the cultural norm for adultery would be met with either stoning or vendetta even to this day? Augustine, Ambrose, and Nikon all document in their writings the controversy this passage has caused in the congregations of their days for what this passage of scripture seemed to imply. Yet the authenticity of this passage was never an issue for Augustine, Ambrose, Jerome, or Didiamus in the 4th century. Augustine in North Africa cites this as a possible reason why it was removed from the scriptural text of his day. Nikon, a Greek father, also testifies that the Armenians in his day were ripping this passage out from their scriptural texts for the same reasons addressed by Augustine and Ambrose. Bergeon, in his defense of John 7:53 to 8:11, cites the testimony of these fathers to explain why some Greek and Aramaic texts are deficient in this passage. This same reasoning also helps to explain why this passage of scripture was moved in the liturgy to October 8th. For then, the passage is acquainted with the Day of Repentance, which makes this passage easier to digest, especially if it signifies that the adulteress repented. Now James White has lauded the statements of St. Augustine as silly. Really? So scribes running all around the ancient world interpolating this passage into thousands of Greek, Latin, and some Aramaic texts without anyone ever noticing that cannot be historically verified is sound reasoning Yet we cite three independent respected fathers of the churches who report on the difficulty the congregations of their day had reconciling this passage with the cultural norms of their day, which both Augustine and Nikon both stated led to the removal of this passage in scriptural texts. Yet this is illogical. Augustine, in his letter to Jerome, personally commended Jerome on his translation of the Gospels from the original Greek, stating, we are in no small measure thankful to God for the work in which you have translated the Gospels from the original Greek, because in almost every passage we have found nothing to object to when compared to the original Greek scriptures. Do White, Wallace, and Ehrman realize the significance of this statement? For Augustine in this same letter had already communicated to Jerome the problems that his translation of the Old Testament from the Hebrew caused amongst the Greeks in a congregation of North Africa, after the reading from his transcription of Jonah. Yet, Augustine found nothing to object to in Jerome's Gospel translation, after a comparison to the Greek manuscripts that Augustine and the Church of Hippo had access to. Jerome's empirical observation in the 4th century on the PA is no different than what we see today.
for we have over 1400 Greek manuscripts that have this passage, while around 268 do not. Hmm, that kind of agrees with Jerome's and Augustine statements. So, White, Wallace and Ehrman, even in light of this empirical data, the biggest issue is how did this passage find its way into many Greek and Latin manuscripts prior to the 4th century? Let's be honest, how do you physically walk into these apostolic churches, which were underground at the time, and go in and start changing the texts without being noticed? Are you going to have us believe that the Donatists had no problem allowing their texts to be changed, even though they would not recognize bishops who turned over texts during the persecution of Diocletian? Do you wonder why I liken these conspiracy theories to Peter Pan and fairy tales? Because in Peter Pan, Kids just need a little pixie dust, and they can fly out their window to Neverland. But in reality, that doesn't work. The same thing is said for these so-called interpolation theories in regards to the PA. Think about it. How do we get access to the texts of North Africa, Milan, Spain, Alexandria and Rome? These are large geographical areas, not to mention the Greek texts that Jerome and Augustine had access to. How did they even know where the churches were prior to 300? So when you reject the testimony of Jerome, Ambrose, Nikon and Augustine, how do you explain that most of the Apostolic Greek, Latin and some Aramaic texts throughout the Mediterranean world basically came up with this same passage? And in most cases, the passage is found in the same chapter of St. John's Gospel, if it doesn't go back to the originals. Otherwise, you have to historically demonstrate who created this passage, when and where it was done, and how it got into the majority of independent Greek and Latin texts prior to the 4th century. Since neither White, Wallace or Ehrman can explain this, we must presume the innocence of the Greek apostolic churches, unless they can prove them guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. We will be waiting for your reply.